chapter 10. I am calling this theories of evolution because different people hold different ideas and we're going to get into Lamar theory, Darwin's theory, and so forth. But basically, what the theory of evolution is, or theories, is that somehow in distant time, non-living chemicals finally arranged themselves in the living cells, and then living cells became like clams and so forth, and finally became fish, and then evolved into amphibians and reptiles, and then mammals, and then man. That's the theory of evolution. Really, when you get down to it, there's really only two explanations for origin. So a person who doesn't believe in God, they've got to think of some way we got here. And that's where the theory of evolution came in. So briefly it's this. It's particles evolved into elements. Elements evolved into chemicals and complex chemicals. So you, you have like elements like nitrogen, hydrogen, evolved into amino acids, evolved into carbohydrates and proteins and so forth, and then into living cells. Finally, the living cells evolve into more complex life, and then complex animal life eventually form man by means of innate properties. The theory of evolution tries to explain origins in terms of just natural laws and phenomena that exist and operate today. No external process allowed. No God, no creator, no supernatural, just natural processes somehow cause life to be. Now, there are some assumptions in evolutionary thinking. The first is that non-living chemicals somehow gave rise to living materials. Assume that somehow these single-celled organisms gave rise to multi-celled organisms. And then these invertebrates, you know what an invertebrate is? That's an animal with a backbone, somehow gave rise to fish. Then fish gave rise to amphibians. In other words, fish with fins evolved and became amphibians fins with legs. Amphibians then evolved into reptiles. And reptiles evolved into birds and mammals. Is this scientific? Has anybody experimentally verified this? The theory of evolution rests on two foundations. One is eons of time. But have you ever asked them the question, well, how come you can't observe evolution taking place? What answer do they give you? Well, the answer that I've been given is, well, it's so slow we can't observe it. So the theory of evolution depends on eons of time. That's why they hate people like me who say the earth was created in six days. That's why they hate people like me who said man's only been here 6,000 years because that completely destroys the evolutionary theory. If you don't have millions and billions of years of time, their theory falls like a deck of cards. The second thing it rests on is chance. Somehow by chance, random chance and process, by billions of combinations, that somehow by chance they arrange themselves into a living cell. Now what I am going to do in this course is I am going to destroy these two foundations, hopefully. When it comes to time, I'm going to destroy things like the radiometric dating process and so forth, Give you, show you why that's not valid. When it comes to chance, I've got a chapter on mathematical improbabilities. I'm going to show you how it's mathematically improbable that something as complex as a living cell could possibly take place. But they continue to say things like this. This is a quote from evolution. It's, However improbable we regard the origin of life, given enough time, it will almost certainly happen at least once. The impossible becomes impossible, the possible becomes probable, and the probable becomes virtually certain. Somebody else has said that, that time, in their case, is the hero of the plot. One only has to wait. Time itself performs a miracle. Given enough time, things evolve from simple to complex. Even though we cannot observe the process, even though we cannot demonstrate it, even though we cannot prove it or verify it, what we need is time. Time's the hero of the plot. 
we're going to destroy those foundations in this course, hopefully. We've already answered this question. This is a good review for your quiz. Why is it impossible to offer scientific proof of origins? Well, you can't observe it, you can't repeat it, you can't verify it, you can't perform a scientific experiment. If scientists could produce life, and I don't think they're going to, but, you know, I could be wrong. Say right now, man will never create life. I don't think he will. But I'll say this, if he could, if he ever does, it won't be by random process, it's just chance. He won't just throw some chemicals in the soup to walk away and, and out pop some life. It'll be a design, careful design. And, you know, billions are being spent on all kinds of genetic research and so forth. It won't be an accident. People lots of times say that Evolution, the idea of evolution originate with Darwin. It, that's really not so. Evolutionary theory goes way back. Aristotle, back 300 and some BC, he believed in a gradual transition from imperfect to the perfect, that man stood at the highest point of one continuous ascent. Epicurus, Paul encountered the Epicureans at Athens. Epicurus was a philosopher, and he thought that simple life forms had developed, that living things might have developed from simple life forms. Lamarck preceded Darwin just a little bit and influenced Darwin. He had an idea. He is known for what was called the theory of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. For example, his explanation for the giraffe having a long neck was they stretched and they stretched and they stretched until they could get the fruit. And then because they stretched and got a little longer neck, then their offspring had longer necks. And they stretched and they stretched. In other words, they passed on by inheritance an acquired characteristic. Just like a, a, the idea would be if a blacksmith you know, somebody or a weightlifter just builds huge muscles that that would automatically be transmitted to their kids. No, if the kid doesn't lift any weights, he's going to be puny like the rest of us. You know what I mean? So you don't, you do not. They disproved Lamarck's idea. A, a guy did it with mice. He had mice and he cut the tails off the mice and then he bred them. And you know what the little mice had? They had tails. Cut their tails off and bred them. You know what they had? Mice with tails. They kept on breeding. I think it was like 22 generations of mice, and then they finally quit. They showed that, you know, whether you disuse or use, you don't pass it on. Hey, if, if you get a skill saw and you cut some of your fingers off, that doesn't mean your kids aren't going to have any fingers. This was his theory. And his thought was this use, disuse thing. Darwin, though, is credited with popularizing evolution. He came up with a book in 1859 called The Origin of Species. Any of you know what his subtitle for his book, The Origin of Species, was? The subtitle of his book is The, the Preservation of Favored Races. Early evolutionists were, were racist. They, were, they believed that the white man was the pinnacle of the evolutionary pattern. They don't talk about that very much because of social pressures. But uh, that's it. you read some of their early evolutionary comments, very racist. Now Darwin's idea was a little different. Darwin would explain the long-necked giraffe as follows. He would explain that only the long-necked ones could reach the apples in the tree or whatever they ate. And the short ones couldn't get the apples, and so it was the survival of the fittest. Only the tall ones could survive. That makes a little more sense than Lamarck's. But nowhere has anybody became a new species because of it. And then, of course, the other answer to that is if the giraffes survived, well, how did the rabbits survive then? Shark giraffes couldn't survive. What about the rabbits and all the other shark animals? So I don't think his explanation is very good. But to a certain degree, survival of the fittest thing, it does kind of preserve the race. And there were some people, people who are 
are really misfunctioning, uh, can't have children, and so it does kind of, it preserves a species rather than creates new species. There was another theory of evolution. Darwin proposes evolution, but really didn't have a mechanism. And it was de Vries, Hugo de Vries, who came up with an idea as for a mechanism for evolution. He actually, what he observed was a primrose reed. He observed that some of the plants were quite different one from another. And he came up with the idea that there were mutations, and mutations eventually caused new species. Well, the problem with mutations, and, that, and you can cause mutations. You can radiate, radiate x-rays and so forth, ultraviolet uh, violet plants. You can uh, radiate fruit flies. They, they've done a lot of experiments on them. But what happens is that mutations are almost always harmful. I mean, maybe you can radiate a fruit fly and it'll have purple eyes, but it'll probably live half the time that a normal was. I mean, you may get some varieties, but they aren't any stronger, and you never create a new species. And as I said, most are harmful. It's like an, if 999 out of 1,000 mutations are harmful, it's like you trying to climb up a ladder, you go up one rung and then go down 999. Go up one, go down, you're not going to get very far, are you? It's harmful, and mutations are, from all I've read, it's not beneficial, but that's their struggling hope of how it could possibly change the things mutations occur and then new species 